everybody. Thank you for coming today. And thanks for joining us for our West Week panel, The Dream Home of Tomorrow, Visionary Multifamily Housing. We would like to thank our gracious virtual host, Fondam, Vanguard in and out furniture. Um, and in a few moments, we look forward to diving into a very dynamic discussion. But first I want to introduce our moderator, Francis Anderton. Noted LA design writer and broadcaster, Francis has hosted KCRW's weekly radio show, DNA, Design and Architecture, which brings design alive with stories of how it shapes lives in LA and beyond. For many years, she produced KCRW's acclaimed current affairs shows to the point and which way LA. She has served as a correspondent for the New York Times and Well Magazine. Her books include Grand Illusion, A Story of Ambition and Its Limits on LA's Bunker Hill, and You Are Here, another book on the way titled, uh, coming up soon, Common Ground, Multifamily Housing in Los Angeles. Thank you, Francis, so much for moderating today's panel. I'll turn it over to you. Well, it's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. And I'm especially enjoying the Vendôme scene that I'm sitting in right now. And, and with that, um, let's quickly introduce our panelists. And then we're going to get into a conversation about a topic that I think we're all very interested in, which is multifamily housing and its potential to be a kind of a dream mode of living in Los Angeles. Um, so we have with us Richard Loring developer, Justin Riegler with Vendôme, Lorcan O'Herlihy architect. I'm going to hand off to you to quickly give us a little um, sketch about yourselves and then we'll go into the conversation. Let's start with you, Richard. Okay, thank you, Francis. Um, glad to be here on this panel. Um, I, I've only been a developer for 20 years, that's all. And uh, before that, I, I spent 20 years as a, uh, as a builder. Um, and I started out in my career uh, as an architect at uh, University of Michigan. So I've um, participated in all of those fields and um, enjoyed it enormously. And you continue to do so and you continue to build and we're gonna hear about that. Um, Justin. Thank you. Um, uh, following in uh, Richard's footsteps, uh, very grateful to be able to be a part of the panel and um, ultimately be able to sponsor the conversation. Um, my background um, goes well beyond my, my age. Uh, my family has been involved in high-end furniture for a very long time. Um, my mother's worked in restoration hardware for the better part of 35 years and she's been in charge of coincidentally sourcing and quality assurance for outdoor furnishings, which is sort of what led me into the field. Um, Spent 12 years with a smaller brand, ended up becoming an equity partner in the brand, um, very amicably and successfully sold my shares. And um, after being uh, semi-retired at 30-something and bored, I jumped on the Von Dom bandwagon and I've been with the company for the better part of three years now. Wow, I hope you're less bored. Less bored. <laughs> <laughs> and what's scary about what you just said is you said your mother started with restoration hardware. I remember when restoration hardware was founded. So um, it, it's just saying something about how we how, how time marches on for all of us. So um, Lorcan, to you. Thank you, Francis. What a pleasure to be here. Uh, quick overview was uh, uh, spent my uh, formative years as a child both in Europe. I was born in Dublin, spent time in Dublin and Los Angeles as a child. And uh, uh, yeah, I was thrilled to uh, connect with architecture in the late 70s, early 80s in school, spent having graduated on the undergrad program, went to New York for, or the East Coast for about eight years, and then reconnected with Los Angeles in the early 90s to start my practice. And I've been a practitioner here uh, over the last close to 30 years, uh, in addition to being a teacher at a number of uh, institutions, SciArc, uh, uh, USC and certainly within uh, in, in London as well, the Architectural Association. So, but a practitioner and excited to be uh, part of the panel discussion talking about uh, multi unit housing. And um, most importantly, I think just in terms of people understanding the kinds of projects we're talking about, you and Richard have collaborated on a lot of projects and we will touch on some of those. Um, so, so, yes, anyway, so our topic is, I guess living the dream in Los Angeles. And the dream 
the Living the Dream in Los Angeles has for many decades taken the form in people's minds of the single family home. This has certainly been a laboratory for amazing experiments in the single family home, the design of the single family home in the creation of lifestyle. LA, California has led the world in kind of reinventing lifestyle and the, and the, and the buildings that enshrine that. Well, the reality is that we're running out of land. It's no longer tenable to keep on building single family homes for environmental reasons, for economic reasons. There's a whole bunch of factors that now mean that LA in the 21st century is seeing what multi-unit housing becoming the, the, the norm for probably the majority of people. Um, and within that, th there's probably the majority is actually renting and some will be owning condos. But, the, but, the, but, but, but what, what, I'm, what I would like us to discuss today is the, is, is the evolving dream of life, for lifestyle in Los Angeles and how and I see you two very, you, when I say you two, I mean you, Richard and Lorcan, in terms of some of the multifamily, I know, let's just stop here and say, I, I, I sometimes say multifamily housing and, you, and, and I hear you say multi-unit housing. We're kind of talking about the same thing mm -hmm. here, but, um, in, but let's just know that that terminology applies to the, those two, those two terminologies apply to the same thing. So multi-unit housing, you two have very much led the way with great design innovation. And we are going to talk about that in a moment, but I wanted us to kick off with actually just a little reflection on what do we mean when we talk about the California dream home? What are its elements? And with that, we can go into discussing how that can make its way into multi-unit or multi-family housing as well. So I'd like each of you, one after the other, to just reflect on what is the California dream home? And is it a specific home, the Chemosphere House, the Schindler House, or is it a, a type of home? Anyway, let's do that. And starting with you, Richard. Well, I'm going to I'm going to go retro and uh, I'm going to talk about my favorite home in, in Los Angeles, which is the Gamble House mm -hmm. uh, in Pasadena by, by Green and Green. We're talking uh, a century. We're talking a century ago. A century ago, yeah, when I was a child. Um, <laughs> and um, that was one of the first uh, pieces of architecture I visited when I moved to L.A. back in 1980. Um, and it remains one of my favorite pieces of residential architecture in, in Los Angeles. And, what did you like about it? Uh, the things I really, well, first of all, the craftsmanship is... Um, you know, be, be almost beyond our ability to describe or comprehend these days. So, uh, you know, the house is basically a large piece of cabinetry. Um, they were very reliant on inexpensive labor. So it's, it's certainly not something we can replicate or, or aspire to today, but, you know, it's, it's a gorgeous object. So as, as, a, as an architectural object or a piece of art, um, you know, it, it definitely hits the mark for me. But I think a lot of the things that they that the Green Brothers did to kind of understand and work with the climate out here, I think, are, are notable. You know, so they had the you know very deep overhangs that provided uh, shade uh, to the interior of the homes because this was back in the time when they had no air conditioning. So you had to find you had to figure out ways to keep the homes uh, relatively cool. They have those gorgeous outdoor sleeping porches. Um, again part of the attempt to kind of make the houses habitable uh, at the, the height of the summer. Um, you know, relatively open planning considering that day and age, um, you know, very nice flow from one area into another. Um, and then, you know, obviously very generous outdoor area. <laughs> uh, all of those things are, are hard to replicate in um, multifamily housing, but uh, it's nice to think about nice to think about and there's certain attributes that we can think about so um so justin tell us about your dream california home um having grown up in marin county um there is a huge collection in various parts of the bay area of um you know very traditional eichlers mm -hmm. and i've always been drawn to the concept of eichlers the incorporation of um 
you know, not coincidentally in outdoor living, um, you know, the use of light in expanding a space that otherwise is rather small footprint. Um, but if I really had to get back to my favorite, my favorite home in terms of modern architecture, contemporary architecture, it wouldn't be in California at all, but it's something that would fit the mold of Marin County today, and that would be Falling Water, the Frank Lloyd mm -hmm. Wright classic. Mm. Um, purely for the fact that I'm a, I'm a big supporter um, and an avid believer that biophilic design, um, you know, isn't just about living walls and house plants. It's about incorporating the actual nature in and around you um, into your design um, from the very beginnings of the home, um, whether it be building a home around a tree or uh, building a home, you know, in this instance, through um, a series of various waterfalls and a hillside. Um, I'm just a big believer that incorporating nature into life at home um, is better for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and, th and is that just for anyone who might not be familiar with the term biophilic? Mm -hmm. um, it, th is that the definition that, that it incorporates nature or that it emulates nature or that it is nature? I want to say it's a little bit of, of everything. I mean, my, my structured definition of biophilic would be the incorporation of living things into your architectural plan, into your design schematic. Um, but beyond that, it can be, um, you know, the incorporation of the outdoors to the indoors via, um, you know, additional glass paneling instead of, you know, traditional partitions and exterior walls. Um, there's a number of people who would argue the exact definition of biophilic design. Um, you know, but, but to my understanding and to my belief, it really is the incorporation of nature into the design of a project, whether it be entirely indoor or indoor outdoor or outdoor. Great, got it, got it. Lorcan. <laughs> Boy, there's a, a number of quite good ones. I was, when, when, uh, when I'm thinking my mind not only goes into the world of houses, but also buildings, you know, what are extraordinary buildings that I also admire within the city of LA, but that is the Salk Institute. But when we <laughs> focus on houses, I mm -hmm. have to say the, the Schindler House, uh, I have a history <laughs> having been engaging it, but I do recognize how important it was about how they uh, redefining living rooms, how it redefines dining rooms and bedrooms, how it ties into the inside outside, how you frame outside spaces, all that. I have to say, even though it's uh, obviously uh, quite a bit of time, be, uh, this was built, uh, Schindler House was built, it is an extraordinary uh, iconic house. And I do see that the DNA of that particular house and that speculating that was done uh, by Schindler was uh, set the table for um, extraordinary work in the years to come. And uh, that has really been, um, to me, one of the more important houses historically uh, to this day. It, it has loved the idea that's what spatial quality, but the idea you can sleep outside in these pods, how you can pull the building apart, create outdoor rooms, how you can redefine the idea of shared experiences and how two families can live in a single house. All those aspects are so relevant even today. And it's what, 1922, that building? Yeah, so it's almost years. a century old. And believe me, I was so flabbergasted when I learned much later about the Schindler House than I did about the Villa Savoy by Le Corbusier, which we, which was, I think, built even maybe a year or two after the Schindler House. Yes. And it was sort of staggering to me that Le Corbusier's house had become, you know, so much more known globally than mm -hmm. Schindler's remarkable work. And I agree with you. So there's two of you have picked out an aspect of a house that you both have found delightful. I'm going to start with that as we now move into a conversation about multifamily. Richard and Lorcan, you've both picked houses that have sleeping porches. Mm -hmm. And this has been an element, you know, each of you in different ways has, has homed in on elements of, of the California way of living that's allowable because of the weather. And certainly one of the strange and lovely attractions to coming to live in California was you could sleep on a sleeping porch. I don't know if anybody ever actually did, but, but we do know that those early architects mm -hmm. built in these sleeping porches. Okay, so let's start with that. If you're coming up with your ideal multifamily housing development, can you incorporate sleeping porches? Uh, Go for it, Richard. Go for it, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you asking? Um, yeah, I meant to. I meant to designate one of you to ask, so I'll designate <laughs> you, Richard. All right. Um, 
you know, in, in concept, there's no reason you can't, right? There's, there's no reason you can't. Um, there's no code restrictions. There's no technical reason you couldn't do it. Um, you know, outdoor building and incorporating outdoor spaces in multifamily projects, uh, as most people know, are it's an expensive proposition. And so when you're thinking about, you know, what to include um, in terms of outdoor space or what that outdoor space looks like or functions like or how it's planted or, um, you know, you're always as certainly if you're working with a developer, you're always going to be coming back and measuring everything against cost, unfortunately. So, um, you know, the, the, one of the reasons that the, the, this equation is so difficult, I think, in the United States is because, um, you know, the development community by and large has very, very different goals than the, um, than the architectural community. And so there's, a, there's a, always a constant uh, tension that, uh, you know, kind of holds us back many, many times from, from doing our best work, doing the best work you can do. Mm -hmm. Very uh, interesting. Yeah. Sorry, I mean, Lorcan. No worries. I can jump on that also. I do think the kinds of spaces uh, that uh, like those, these outdoor uh, experiences does make the environment better, the quality of li living. And uh, both indoor and outdoor spaces are equally as important as far as I'm concerned. I, Richard knows this. I believe there's design equity in outdoor spaces. And we had this conversation on a number of our projects over the years where can you bring value by actually carving away uh, and provide that outdoor spaces. And I think we both equally agree that yes, that is something that creates a better environment, a better place to live. So in California, you certainly can do it. Uh, the weather is good that you can certainly, you can't do this in Boston as much, but uh, that's something that I'm committed to. And I think uh, it may not specifically about sleeping pods, but you can certainly create outdoor spaces where people can uh, engage it from a living room context or other type of programs. And I think it can't be more relevant now uh, you can see that houses are going to open up or housing that we're doing that we're involved both rich and i are working on a project right now those outdoor spaces are part of the uh, uh, crucial components of housing you need to have open that up and create those environments where people can be outside i also think the idea of a front lawn of a house that used to be critical to uh, uh, houses both backyards and front yards but one can imagine that can you accomplish that within housing and I believe you can. You can create those aspects that people used to have as homes. You can bring, or houses, you can bring it into housing. And I believe that's what's going to make the new type of uh, dream home might very well be an apartment. If one can bring those aspects, those equity that one has in a house, and also the idea that you can do this in urban areas. That's what we're trying to do with our work. And it is working. Uh, people do recognize the value of that move, that this idea of inside out spaces uh, are equal. And one can create this wonderful place to live. And it's better for one's health, for one's well being, lots of light, open spaces, passive circulation, places to gather and chat. All those aspects become more relevant when you have an outdoor space that allows for it. Um, great. Number of things. First of all, I just want to ma make clear that the project that you just mentioned, the one that you two are working on right now is Rossmore 410, and we will come to that shortly. Um, we, but I want to go back to the very beginning of your partnership and talk about Habitat 825. Do that momentarily. Mm -hmm. Even before I get to that, though, I just want to go back to Justin. Justin, you are currently sitting against a backdrop of outdoor furniture. Um, so clearly you, you serve the market in a way that's interested in having some kind of outdoor living experience. So, um, so tell me from the vantage point of, 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 of someone who is in the, in the, in the, in the high-end furniture market you know what that indoor outdoor lifestyle i guess enables and how outdoor furniture is kind of evolving you know as some of our housing types are also evolving well it's um it's a great question and it it makes me want to rewind back about i say a decade ago maybe 11 years ago when i got involved working my first project for a multi-family um, you know, new construction in San Francisco is in Santana Row. And I look at what the ff &E package was, specifically the outdoor package for the amenity spaces for that project. And I look at the packages now, whenever I'm looking at a spec book for, for something that needs to be bid. And it's incredible what, what people like Lorcan and Richard are doing 
in terms of creating spaces, livable spaces that are primarily outdoor, covered outdoor for the residents of these, of these buildings. Essentially what you're doing is you're giving someone everything they could ever dream of wanting in the way of amenities without confining them to an indoor pool or a gymnasium or an arcade or a movie theater, whatever it may be. I mean, technology and, and products have grown and developed and evolved so much over the last decade plus that now you can have outdoor entertainment spaces. You can have movies outside. You can have music outside. You can have outdoor golf simulators, outdoor pool tables. And of course, now you have effectively in outdoor furniture. I mean, what, what you're looking at behind me is a completely upholstered waterproof product, which 10 years ago didn't even exist. So the evolution of, of what Richard and Lorcan are doing in terms of their, their design concepts and the brilliance that goes into their, um, their development process, it just aids in our ability to create products that, that meet their needs and meets the needs of the tenants of these buildings. So for me, it's an exciting time because the more and more they improve on what they do, the more and more space it gives me with which to work in terms of our company developing products that will meet that need. Now I'm curious what the sofa's made of. So it's a, it's, it's a loaded product, a four-part construction process. It's a uh, solid steel 316 grade um, marine skeleton, marine grade steel skeleton. It then has injected polyurethane foam blown around the skeleton. Um, so effectively it's liquid foam and as it hardens, it turns into the same um, typology as a car seat. So it has a bit of a memory quality to it. And then an elastomeric waterproof coating is put over the entire foam structure. And then it's upholstered in a 100% um, polypropylene threaded upholstery. So it's not even a traditional solution dyed textile like a sombrella or whatnot. It's woven threaded microfibers made of a plastic. Now it sounds mm -hmm. uncomfortable, but it's then coated with something that almost makes it feel like a, a velvety sort of Berber rug texture. Hmm. So, so I suppose it, it sounds like it's a piece of furniture that can be in nature, but it's not necessarily of nature in that it's using some pretty formidable man-made materials and plastics to provide that kind of um, defense against the rain. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, the, the only thing, the only thing that you could sort of tie back to, you know, the commitment to sustainability that we have through most of our other products is that the thread that's used for the upholstery is all 100% recycled polypropylene. Um, it's difficult with a product like this where you're going to leave it outside permanently. I mean, this is an uncovered 100% weatherproof product, um, you know, without really throwing in technology, mm -hmm. um, you know, and man-made products to support the durability. So I think no. you would look at you would look at a product like this and you would say, okay, you know, the benefit is the sustainability of it, right? It's going to last for an extremely long time in a high traffic environment. Yeah. So, so, so durability, the sustainability lies in the durability. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a very interesting sidebar. There's a very interesting plax, plastics expert I spoke to recently and her very interesting argument on sustainability as it relates to plastics is we should simply hold on to them. We should hold on to them just like we hold on to other fine materials. So, um, but anyway, so, okay. So your image drew me into the story of the sofa, which, and it is really interesting what you say about the amplification of the amenity package, which now makes living outdoors, you know, have even more attractions than it used to. So let's, so let's now go back, as I said, to the start of Richard and Lorcan's partnership, developer designer partnership. And that was with um, Habitat 825, which is right next door to the Schindler House, which Lorcan mentioned was the seminal house for him in Los Angeles. So both of you, if you will, um, let's see, I guess we'll go in order like we've been going. <laughs> Richard, you know, that was that was a very interesting project. It was it was it was interesting in terms of being next door to that iconic building and it was interesting in terms of trying to showcase what you could do with a condo development mm -hmm. 
Uh, uh, first thing I'll point out, um, Francis, is that the, that was actually actually our second project. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, yes, no, it's okay. It we, did, uh, we did one on the gardener before that. That's right. Um, That's yeah, right. Remind project. me the address of the gardener one. I think it was ten fifty. That's right. Yes. Ten fifty. Ten fifty. Ten fifty. Okay, so you lived <laughs> to tell the tale, and you moved on to the next project. Yeah. Moved on to the next one. Yeah. And um, you know, the gardener project was a condo project, as was. Um, uh, 825. And because those projects were condominium projects, we had uh, Lorcan uh, and I had more freedom in terms of what we could uh, do um, architecturally and form wise and materiality. Um, simply because, you know, on the sales end, there, there's fewer constraints. In other words, if you do a product that is attractive enough, spectacular enough, you can get paid for that product. Whereas in the rental market, there are, you know, kind of limits, you know, it's a little, the rental market makes experimentation a little harder because of those limits, but 825, there were, there, we didn't feel like we had those limits. Turns out we were right, <laughs> fortunately. And, um, you know, we did a lot of, uh, I, I think the, the most interesting thing we did is, is we, you know, approached the Schindler house with, with great care, you know, great, Delicacy, and I think I'll I think I'll let Lorcan talk about sure the, the absolutely. That we did. Yeah. <laughs> I can do that indeed. Uh, I would say that most of our work, and certainly you learn by fire in a sense uh, when you're involved with projects. So we do really see context as being crucial, and the history, and frankly, the uh, uh, you know the engagement of adjacencies in these projects, these urban info projects we do. Certainly from a housing standpoint, what was intriguing about that particular project was to recognize not only the importance of not casting shadows over it. It's a smaller house. We were building one of a greater density. And so the way that we manipulate the massing of our building was really important, how to respect and admire what was there. I've always felt that uh, architecture is about looking at the parameters of each project and understanding the history, understanding the context, and understanding that uh, one has to respond accordingly. But I think that makes the projects better. So in that particular project, we pushed the, the density of the building of the height next to the Schindler House, 15 feet lower than that was allowed. And we pushed that density to, in a sense, the other side of the building where thus you were not casting shadows on the Schindler House. So it's a very simple move, but very important one. The other aspect of the design was we weren't uh, trying to draw inspiration from the design of the Schindler House, but more of the social aspects. Can you carve out uh, voids in the middle and create the quintessential how, uh, courtyard housing project, which we did, uh, but also we carved out an opening, a, a kind of in a way, a breathing space between the Schindler House and our building. There's, a, there's an open, uh, in a way, open space right between the two. So that when you're at the Schindler House, you're not looking at a solid wall. You just have one volume on the second story and an opening below it. So those kind of massing studies was really important to really understand how you can respect the your adjacent, certainly a historical landmark. Uh, that was crucial to it. We did do that. Um, uh, and I'm very proud of that because if you go there, you go into the courtyard, you begin to see there's a, there's a breathing space between the Schindler House and our building. You see that it's 30 feet tall, not 45. And those aspects were crucial to design. I think that's how architects should respond accordingly. We've done a number of other projects now next to the the Strathmore project uh, by Neutra. We're also doing another project right now, another very important project in UCLA next to a Lautner project. So our work has been evolved from that experience where people are hiring us to know how can you design sensitively, but bring good ideas and be provocative as long as one responds to the adjacencies. And that's what we do very, we do in all of our work. So we respect, but also push the envelope in terms of design, bring artistry, but recognize how important it is to understand the context. So when you say Strathmore, you mean Richard Neutra's Strathmore Apartments in Westwood yes, Village. Indeed. And then you said a project next door to Lautner. Do you mean the Lautner we're, Sheets Apartments? Yeah, we're working. We have been commissioned to do another uh, housing project next to that. And for we students. just present. Uh, it's hybrid. It's not specifically for students, but quite obviously there will be students. So uh, it just so happens that we are building a reputation how to build projects next to historically sensitive uh, buildings all came back from that first pro second project Richard and I did, of course, happened wow. in 25. But That's yeah, it. and it's very interesting because the nature of doing those projects, I believe it leads to better solutions. 
when you recognize cities grow incrementally and you have to recognize and take value in what's there and, and engage it in a very important way. And that's what we're doing. Sure, but also, and here we go back to the kind of iconic houses in Los Angeles, the iconic houses in Los Angeles, their designers very definitely push the envelope design wise. So, and you want to too. And, but, but now that you're working a hundred years later and you have this context, you're trying to find a balance between, um, between mm -hmm. fitting in, between fitting in well with that context, learning from the context, mm -hmm. but also making your own statement. Richard mm -hmm. used the word spectacular. You two did Habitat 825. It's 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 vivid. It's 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 lime green. It's it's black. It's mm -hmm. got the drama of the space and the bamboo, and it's 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 non-standard in the arrangement of the forms. I mean, it's it's definitely got some element of spectacle about it. And then you went on to do. Um, uh, Formosa 1140, um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, e Easter, more further east in West Hollywood, um, very dramatic, mm -hmm. kind of vivid orange and red sort of checkerboard facade of, of screens behind which are your circulation spaces and then your lofts. And then there's a very interesting social piece to that story. But let's just stick with the visuals for the time being. Mm -hmm. You're trying to tell us about that. And because that's part of the California dream is, mm -hmm. is, is the is the physical lived sensory experience and it's living in something that's pretty darn dramatic mm -hmm. relative to many houses in most of the world mm -hmm. absolutely should i joke go jump in first richard or would you want to jump you, on here? You go first, okay <laughs> i'll talk some big picture this is again a collaboration with an amazing client richard uh formosa was unique in a sense because and i'll make this as brief as i can it was a long story Existing structure was on that property. There was a, an encouragement to try to keep it. Uh, it was not historically significant. It was, a, it was for want of a better word, a crack house. It was a house that was boarded up. It had been abandoned and uh, the neighbors wanted to get rid of it, but there was this idea within the city to see if we could keep it. Well, frankly, it was too difficult. You couldn't under, you couldn't in a way tuck parking underneath an existing house and also position 11 units on the site, which was important. So we proposed collectively uh, a pocket pop park uh, for the city, for the community, if we were able to remove that house. And that was a very interesting step because in a sense, it's a public park and private land. So we were able to recalibrate the building, push it to the ants, put it, push it to one end and provide a 45 foot by 120 foot deep pocket park that was ran by the city. So this really interesting public private partnership in that project, which I believe is a the future, I believe pocket parks could exist throughout the city of Los Angeles, among other cities, to be able to do that. So you can walk to a small park and they are, people are engaging that park. But that was really interesting. That was, that was in a way rejecting the quintessential courtyard housing, pushing it to the edge and provide that central area that's normally open or common open space to tenants, push it to the edge and open it to the city. And that's what's fascinating about that project. In the end, I believe it's a very important project. You mentioned the kind of choreography, a choreographed at building. I believe artistry and science goes into all good architecture. That's a very efficient building we designed, but freed this up to be able to look at the exterior of the building and bring something to it. And that's what we did. The nature of that kind of in a way, the, the, the artistry of that building was awfully important. It becomes uh, uh, one aspect of the design, which the owners who live in that building love. They really love being building there. And you have this social agency of a pocket park right next to it. What's nice is that building looks out of the park now and not looking at a building eight feet away. Also, the building that's on the other side of the park looks out of the park. The building on the back area, conceivably, when that's developed, can also look onto the park. And then, the, of course, the street engages the park. What an interesting concept if this could be something that could be further developed. Richard? Yeah. Um, oh, there's, there were so many takeaways from that project. Uh, yeah. You know, I think the most important thing to understand when you look at a project like uh, Formosa is the, you know, the potential between, you know, private and public uh, enterprises, right? Um, you know, when you think about public-private partnerships, you know, you think of, you know, enormous scale, usually that's what comes to mind, mm -hmm. but it can also be done on a, on a more modest scale. You know, if, if the participants are willing and, and if, the, uh, if the city can, can be flexible enough uh, to, to, to make it work for, for the private partner, 
that, that they're working with. Mm -hmm. So that was a great example of a city uh, trying to be as flexible as, as they could be. Um, you know, in retrospect, I, I probably should have asked for more flexibility, but, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, you know, but there, there's an argument to be made. Uh, you know, if you want really good architecture or great architecture, and if you want public spaces, um, you need cities um, to support these efforts. And, you know, support means, in, at least in my mind, in my profession, means increased density. That's what it means. You know, if you want private parties to spend the money to create something significant, the kinds of buildings that Lorcan does every day or every month or every year, um, you, you need support. You need a city to say, yeah, you know, uh, add another story, guys. <laughs> you know? um, thank you for that park. Add another story to the building. So you, you need that kind of cooperation. So um, I think it's I think it's a it's a model that can absolutely work in the future. But again, you need you need city government to kind of break free from a lot of constraints that they seem to have to work under. Right. Now, I think it's a very good point. It's yeah. a step in the right direction and, and uh, to be able to work with Richard and the city, all the complexities of that particular project to be able to make that work was was complicated. And yep. uh, I agree with you, uh, density is important. So if one provides a pocket park, some of the, that the community can walk to, then there should be an opportunity to be able to look at density and say, okay, in yep. return of that move, we can work with you to cr create some greater density. Yep. Got it. Um, we should we should talk about um, Rossmore 410. Um, and, but I'll, I'm gonna bring in Justin, who's sitting in his outdoor furniture. Um, mm -hmm. So so the project we're about to talk about, Justin, that Richard and Lorcan are working on is a co-living building. Well, it's an integration of a co-living with a more traditional apartment building, and it's an integration of a piece of classic, a piece of historic architecture, I should say, very old architecture with new. Um, but, but primarily, it is part of this new phenom that we're seeing, which is this co-living, very, very popular right now. Are you, is your company um, involved with any projects where, where we're having this where we're having this new kind of trade-off in space, the, the, the very private, very small, I should say, the very small bedroom, but the larger shared spaces, the larger shared dining areas, the, 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 the more, more shared amenities, the emphasis on the shared spaces. Are you involved with these kind of projects? So, yes, we're involved with these kind of projects, but it's, it's not just happening in the world of multifamily residential. It's happening with a lot of, of sort of contemporary boutique hotel chains as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you look at the new trend in hotels, places like um, you know, Pod, Citizen M, uh, Yotel. I mean, all of these hotel groups now are adopting the same philosophies because they're paying attention generation, ugh, generationally to their clientele. And they're mm -hmm. looking what's happening. You, you have two generations now, millennials, and even we're getting into zennials, we're getting to an age where, you know, they're starting to spend their own money and they're starting to travel on their own and they want to live on their own and whatnot they're getting away from a demand or a need for privacy. And in exchange, they're, they're giving themselves more towards this communal style of living. And for me, it's cool. I, I think it's amazing. I, I think it's a great way of, of building back, you know, necessary social skills that may have been lost to the internet generation. And if it's going to happen, you know, via, you know, living in a slightly different way, um, whether it be in their own private residence or on the road at a hotel, I'm all for it. I'm 100% behind it. I think one of the most important things in life for anyone is human interaction. And, and this co-living, more communal style of, of life is, is aiding in that process. So I, I think it's great. I'm 100% behind it. Interesting. So yeah, we've got a few more minutes before we get to questions, but just I'm sure people are interested in Rossmore 410. It's a historic, it's on a historic stretch of our of our architecture in Los Angeles. And um, which of you wants to, to, to take it away and just briefly summarize what that project is? All Lauren? yours, Richard. It's all oh, yours, Richard. Richard. <laughs> oh, Richard. You know, I jumped, I jumped in the other one. It's, it's always a problem for Lorcan and I to decide who talks about our project. <laughs> <But anyway. laughs> um, so uh, it's, it's a relatively complicated 
matrix of, of concerns and pressures and influences. But uh, to your point, um, Francis, uh, the, the building, the existing building was uh, constructed back for, most, for the most part back in the 1930s. Uh, it was never finished, interestingly enough. They, they went up to five stories. It was supposed to be a, uh, I think a 12 or 13 story building and they ran out of money, you know? So they just cut it off kind of like you cut through a cake or something <laughs> and lift the top off. you got half the cake. You got half, <laughs> you got half the cake, yeah. And um, so, you know, the, one of the challenges that I talked about with Lorkin and, and his team was, you know, how do you, how do we deal with this older structure that, you know, we want to honor the fact that it's there, it's a survivor, it exists, um, but it's not a uh, truly remarkable piece of architecture. So how do you put what we hope is a remarkable piece of architecture on top of this building and, and behind it and also bring the, the base building itself up with the, the new building. You know, your, your, the base building will, that will look better <laughs> with the new building, I think, on top of yeah. it and behind it. So there's that aspect. And then the other aspect is how do you integrate um, some, you know, 40%, well, not quite 40, I think about 38% of the unit count is co-living. The rest of the units are market rate. And how do you, integrate those two things you know are they separated are they integrated you know those are decisions you know you talk through and you have to and you have to make those decisions and so again you know i'm going to plug lorkin here because uh you know i have found in my career uh you know an, an ideal partner in lorkin because he's so open to every sort of idea every sort of input and I almost never hear the word no from Lorkin. And, and I think he almost never hears the word no from me, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Absolutely. <laughs> and, and that's the nature of the collaboration. We're both very interested in, in supporting, you know, each other and, and trying to get the best that we can get out of a particular opportunity. So right. I would concur. It's been a great partnership in that way. And architecture is complex. And it's also collaborative. You know, there's so many forces that go into it that if you can somehow see those forces as assets like good things, then you come up with better solutions. This particular Rossmore right. project was ideal because as Richard's saying, the complexity of co-living with uh, conventional units, there's certain amenities that go with co-living, there's certain amenities that go with uh, regular units. How do you navigate that? But also how do you build on top of an existing structure? There's always an interesting steps that one has to take. And the solution we came up with was an idea of a step uh, volumes, massings above it, but looked at scale and proportions, but also activating those roofs. Because when you're in a 10 to 12 story or eight story building, you know, one wants to connect outside, but it's not ideal just to go down a stair and elevator and go outside on the ground level. But how do you bring that green space above? So that led to the solution as you begin to see, there's a number of uh, kind of activated green spaces throughout the building above the existing structure. And that's what's exciting for me is that looking at the city uh, in a section way, uh, in a sectional way where you start to see that people want to be able to walk out on the 11th story, 11th floor to an outdoor space. So how do you navigate that? How do you do it from a, an economic standpoint? How do you do it from a, an, you know, an, uh, a social standpoint? All those components, a lot of complexity that goes into these. And how do you build above an important structure that needs to be in a sense, uh, strengthened as well, all those aspects. And we were able to accomplish it, I felt. And uh, to also come up with an intelligent solution as opposed to that overwhelms the existing building, but an intelligent one that brings vibrancy and, and inventiveness, but also seeing that it seems like that it, it seemingly engaged in a very, very fluid and robust way. And we should say that this building that we're talking about here sits right next door to the El Royale, which is one of the storied building apartment buildings dating back to the roaring 20s I guess late roaring 20s and that stretch if since we're talking here about California dream this that stretch of buildings country club manor some of the others they were apartment buildings built often by and invested by, by and for people in Hollywood or attached associated with Hollywood these were sort of playgrounds for the more affluent apartment dweller and at that point the amenities, I don't know if they used the word amenities back then, mm -hmm. but the amenities would be 
perhaps there was a rose garden, there was a tennis court um, down on the ground level, there was a very nice lobby. It was rather New York kind of living, I think, inspired. And then over the road, they had um, a, golf, a golf club. So now those uh, young people now don't necessarily want to go and play golf. Um, and instead, they're going to be up on the roof. Nobody was up on the roof terraces back in the 1930s, as, as, I, as far as I can tell. Um, so anyway, now we've got different kinds of amenities. Um, Justin, back to you, and then we'll go to questions. Just if you already said that this co-living phenomenon is happening in the boutique hotels, um, and you've talked about, you know, how you can bring all, there's all this stuff you can now have outdoors thanks to technology and materials development. You may have already given us all the information, but, but, but just in terms of young people kind of partying, living the dream in a, in a lovely apartment building like Rossmore 410, sort of what are the dream amenities? So what we come across the most, and this is just from my personal experience, um, Things that are experiential that don't involve necessarily, um, I hate to make younger generations sound lazy, but reality is what it is, <laughs> um, doesn't involve too much preparation or energy, you know, put into the experience. So, you know, if it's a golf simulator, you know, flipping a switch and going playing around it at uh, Royal St. Andrews from the comfort of their rooftop, you know, pool deck. Um, other more obscure games, things like bocce ball, um, you know, artificial grass bowling, if you want to throw that in there. Um, obviously pools, you know, pools are a huge part of multifamily living now and, and probably the most important um, outdoor amenity that, that these buildings or at least that tenants look for now um, when considering signing a lease. And, and some of these monthly rents are, you know, four, five, six, depending on where you are, $8,000 a month. Um, so when you're paying that kind of money, you want the absolute best for what you're getting. Um, in regards to, you know, general social gatherings, you know, outdoor sectionals, um, deep lounge seating, um, outdoor televisions, outdoor fire features, um, outdoor bars, you know, movable bars. A lot of kids now will want to entertain from the comfort of their own um, building. So they'll be inviting people over and most of the buildings are, are fairly lenient in terms of the amount of people that they can have, you know, in the um, on rooftop decks or at amenity spaces at a given time. A lot of these buildings now have private party areas or, or private gathering areas that you can um, that you can rent or schedule, I should say, with the building. Um, I think when you really break it down and simplify it, it's just a matter of looking at what your target audience is looking at what they're interested in and then making sure that you provide those amenities because at the end of the day, that's what sells the building. I mean, I wish that people had an appreciation for architecture and the process of architecture that Richard and Morgan and myself have, but the reality is, um, you know, it's a business and it's not necessarily about what I like or what you like. It's about what the customer likes and what the client likes. And I think that if we look at what we're talking about communal spaces and catering to the next generations, um, you know, and, and, completely decked out amenity areas, I think that everybody in this conversation has hit the nail on the head. You know, it's a combination of, of art and science. And part of the science of building these structures is knowing who you're building them for. So. Well, we could keep on going, but but our time has, has run out. And I, I hope Richard and Lorcan, you'll agree that Justin kind of wrapped it up very nicely and um, we we do have a few questions that uh, that have come in from the audience and i'm just going to pose them for you um if if that's okay um first off we should have already stated that Lorcan, much of what you've been telling us actually you have fleshed out in a book that you've recently hmm. released the book is called architecture is a social act I, I wrote the introduction, so I know quite a bit about the book. <laughs> and um, you, can, you can find out far more about Lorcan's work and, and the multifamily housing work he does at multiple economic levels, I should say. Anyway, quick question for anyone interested in getting that book, where mm. can they find it? Oh, indeed they can. They can find it in, uh, it was uh, published by Frame Publishing, which I'm very excited about. Uh, Amazon is one, of course, Hennessy and Ingalls, uh, Arcana and bookstores throughout the US. And Europe. It, oh, it came out in 
late uh, last year in Europe and just early February, it came out in the United States. So it's available uh, <laughs> uh, all over the place and certainly our website as well. Uh, uh, there, those are signed copies. So you can buy it through our website, but also uh, Hennessy & Ingalls, Arcana and all the bookstores. Great, great. Um, okay, Richard, if you, this is, this is, unless you have a book to pitch, we're going to do a more, <laughs> we're going to do. I, I, I was going to grab, grab Lorcan's book off the table next <laughs> week. Hold it up like this. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> someone just wants to know, um, yeah. of all the multifamily housing projects that you've worked on, which one was the most challenging or the most rewarding and why? Um, I think the one that was the most challenging was the same one that was the most rewarding. <laughs> so it's, uh, I think it was 825 uh, mm -hmm. next to Miller House. Um, it, it was challenging because there was, um, you know, there was a lot of resistance um, in the neighborhood to building something new, basically. And so we had to deal with that. And then, of course, the challenges of building right next door to a seminal piece of 20th century architecture uh, was 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 very challenging. And and there are a lot of things that we did on the project that were in response to being next to the Schiller House that we would never do, uh, never do on another kind of projects where you didn't have that type of constraint or, or that type of uh, reference point that you were working with. So, by far, I think that was the most uh, challenging project, but it was also rewarding because uh, you know fully realized it's a it's a uh, you know it's a phenomenal building and and it's a building that appeals, by the way, to people that are not necessarily interested in contemporary design, which I think is very interesting. Um, and I and I you know it had great appeal to to, to, to folks that just weren't that interested in contemporary architecture. So I think it, it shows you that when contemporary architecture is really well done, the audience is much, much wider than one, one might think it is. Um, and it was also rewarding because we, uh, we were very successful on the sales side of it. You know, we got, um, we got top dollar <laughs> for, for, for the product. And so we were justified in, in spending what we had to spend to create that project by what we were able to sell the units for. Right, and that continues. Do you have do you have people that stayed there, lived there, lived there happily, or has there been turnover of you? No, yeah, it was just Los Angeles, so there's always turnover. But mm -hmm. but there are some of the same original buyers still there. But you know, the, the average in LA is people move every seven years. I mean, you know, we, all of us probably know that or have a sense of that. So LA tends to be a city where people are moving around a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And speaking of which, here's a question for you, Justin. Um, the pandemic has obviously changed the way people understand how they live. Um, what new trends have you seen with your clients when purchasing from, from Fondom during this pandemic? And which of the trends do you expect to remain? Uh, well, the most obvious and upfront trend is the need for stuff to be cleaned with bleach or antimicrobial, antibacterial cleansers. So we're, we're very lucky in that regard. We had a, a banner year last year because of the fact that our products naturally are, are antimicrobial, antibacterial, and they can be cleaned with pretty much anything. Um, so to that point, I mean, that, that's definitely probably not a long lasting or a long standing trend, but, you know, in the short term, it's been a huge plus for us. Um, you know, the biggest thing that I've seen from people is from the residential side, whether it's, you know, private single family residences or multifamily, um, there's been a big uptick in lounge furnishing versus, uh, you know, traditionally for residences, we would sell maybe some pool chaises, outdoor dining set, whatnot, but large scale outdoor sofas, sectionals, um, day beds, that's become extremely more popular at the residential level um, over the last year. I think you've seen people adopting the, the concept of a staycation versus a vacation since they don't really have, um, you know, the, the latter is an option right now. Um, creating sort of your own outdoor oasis in the comfort of your backyard has been sort of the mantra that we've been following and that a lot of other brands have been following. Um, I think in the long term, that's going to hold. I think that psychologically what this pandemic has done to a lot of people 
um, be it for good or for bad, um, it has really made them reevaluate, you know, how important it is to them to be going out and traveling versus staying at home with their families. And I think that, you know, you, you got to sort of find, you got to find the good in any crisis if you can. And I think if there's anything good that's come out of it, it's that um, based on the sales that we've seen in the products that we've been selling most of over the past 12 months, that people are really adopting this concept of, of staying at home, enjoying time with their family, limiting the number of people that they have into their homes. Um, you know, so they're, they're killing two birds with one stone. They're following CDC guidelines and they're also getting to enjoy some relaxation at the same time. Well, again, that's a great way to wrap. Um, it's really great to talk to all three of you. Um, Justin Riegler with Fondom, Lorcan O'Herlihy, architect, Richard Loring, developer and builder. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here.